Euh, bonjour à tout le monde. <rire> Ça va? <rire> bonjour. Euh, bonjour. Euh, euh, je suis avec mon grand ami, euh, ami euh, René Chartron. Uh, <laughs> and that's about the extent of my uh, that's French. quite all right that's quite all right really uh, <laughs> congratulations <laughs> very good uh, the, I, I presume we continue this in uh, France oh I oh, certainement certainement <laughs> mon ami uh, <laughs> excuse un moment oh mais bien sûr <laughs> it just runs away. No, uh, unfortunately, my French will not allow uh, me to speak for the rest of this episode in French, although it is an ambition of mine to one day do episodes in foreign languages. Uh, but one day, hopefully, maybe that will be an uh, episode with Rene and myself. But for those of you who are now completely confused, welcome back to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Uh, you know, Le Terre d'Histoire um as we say <laughs> whenever i'm with rene because rene is my good friend from from that old french colony of canada and a proud 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 part of canada that still particularly speaks french i believe rene is it no it's certainly think... uh yes uh, the, the flag's always up about that mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh no it's uh to to common language i live in french Excellent, excellent. Oh, well, yeah. I, I will, like I will definitely. Absolutely. Hence, hence, I felt it. We should start off with that Gallic flair. Um, but today, uh, today, as the meeting meeting title says, we're going to be talking about some some swashbuckling <laughs> in in the in the seventeenth in the seventeenth century in uh, in the age of the of the Sun King, and. The reason for this is because Rene has written another book. <laughs> another book which I've been very excited about because it's about the uh, buccaneers and uh, colonial soldiers of Louis XIV. And so, Rene, you've written four books about the armies of the Sun King so far. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the first four, as it were, about the... Uh... Louis XIV's uh, military establishment, and even uh, some uh, uh, paramilitary too, when if you mm -hmm. enclose uh, others, uh, such as the Maréchal Say, which ends up on battlefield sometimes. Uh, right. But it was all in continental Europe. Mm -hmm. And nothing the yeah, colonies. Exactly. Nothing about North America. Right? Nothing about the colonies. Um, so was it always the plan to? to go this way or did you just um sort of run across these 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 buccaneers and this this particular side of things and think that you had to you had to follow that road um i came across the buccaneers a long long time ago when i lived mm -hmm. in the bahamas mm -hmm. uh so uh, uh it seemed a natural uh id i suppose or mm -hmm. research or whatever you to uh, mm -hmm. look at the, the uh, ambitions of Louis XIV overseas. Yeah, and, and I love I love the fact that um, uh, the way that this book fits into the series kind of places these these sort of freebooters, um, you know, these buccaneers, uh, as they were called. It's a French name. Um, uh, as the sort of the 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 i don't know an arm of foreign policy which is what they were for the for the english uh, as well yes uh they, they all came out by accident in a way uh but uh louis the 14th uh there'd been uh, things going on in the uh, in the west indies of course with uh, various european nations and uh people do, who weren't supposed to be there and uh, they they showed up nevertheless uh since the 16th century um and this evolves sort of in a vacuum mm -hmm. um, why because there's first of all the discoverers of america the spanish mm -hmm. uh 
uh, made a European discovery, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, well, well done. We're not cancelled. <laughs> no, no. uh, and the Portuguese are discovering other stuff too. So mm -hmm. um, the. Uh, you know, the king of Spain, king of Portugal gets on the phone. King of Spain, his cousin is the Pope. And you end up with the, the 1494 treaty that mm -hmm. splits the world into uh, Spain for America and uh, Portugal for the rest, except that little bit of Brazil. And, you know, all it's settled. Well, oh. no, it's not yeah. settled. So... So this is, uh, we're looking specifically at the Caribbean zone at the second, which is obviously claimed by the Spanish due to the treaty, I believe it's of Tordesillas, or one of the treaties, of, one of the treaties of Tordesillas. And um, this obviously is not very popular with the, uh, with the rest of Europe, unsurprisingly. Um, now, as far as I can uh, remember, they would have two choices. You either have to do another treaty somehow, and they have no basis for one. And the only way you can get a basis for one is if you go to war with people. Um, so how how do the buccaneers fit into the royal angst at Spain and Portugal dividing up the world? Well, when the royal ex uh, happens, uh, it doesn't, uh, the buccaneers aren't uh, existing yet. This is mm. in the 16th century, but Francis I uh, of France and Elizabeth of England, uh, she comes out with an argument about free navigation and freedom of the seas. Francis I says, where is the clause in Adam's testament giving the world to, to man? where uh, I am excluded uh, and my realm is excluded uh, mm -hmm. from uh, by the grace of God. He said, show me the clause, dear mm -hmm. Pope. Uh, so, Obviously, the King of France is a good Catholic as well, so it doesn't uh, make any sense on well, that level either. Well, he's a pragmatic Catholic, I'd say. Well, yeah, uh, he's just Catholic. <laughs> it, it, you know, he's it, Italy, it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the, the Spanish were doing that too, to be fair. So it's not. <laughs> well, everybody he, is, was, he, is, he is his Catholic Majesty or something like that, isn't it? Is the yeah. title? Um, it's uh, Sa Majesty très catholique, very, very Catholic. It's very Catholic Majesty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so right. That's a, that's an excellent point from the interest King Francis. Through the Indies, really got started. Uh, and they're not buccaneers, but uh, they're pretty close to them. Uh, cor uh, French corsairs out of uh, coastal France, uh, John Engel in particular, who uh, uh, commissions a lot of corsairs. And in 1523, I think, or 1522, they capture a couple of Spanish ships off the Azores. And when they find the hole, they're, those things are carrying uh, Cortez's treasure. Mm. That makes, wow, all through Europe. And after that, for about 80 years, uh, you know, everybody uh, mm. descends on the Spanish Indies to, to see what uh, they can pick up. Um, by the, that time, it's not only wonderful people like Drake and so on, uh, which are unjustly, by the way, uh, in my view, and uh, I stated in the book and I explain it, uh, treated as pirates and so on. Right. The, the Spanish gave themselves the Spani uh, legal tools mm. in the Spanish law of the Indies, which uh, there's a decree in there, which I'll look at the date. Yes, 1556, uh, 46, 56, 56, where uh, basically they have a law saying foreigners have no business on Spanish mm -hmm land it sort of sounds like in uh, in ukraine today uh, <laughs> the russians and um, you know if we can any so anybody any official and every whatever catches them and they happen to have some booty or something uh, you can kill them on the spot yeah mm -hmm. it's alliance it's license mm -hmm. to kill yeah later yeah. on uh, buccaneers start to their adventurers, mostly from France or from other countries, that sort of wander on the coast of what is now Haiti and other islands, but especially there. It's mm -hmm. then 
it's not barren, but it's not populated. And they become more or less, uh, you might say, uh, uh, woodsmen. Yeah. And small, small groups of people, um, hunters. Living, li living very savagely. There's no women uh, to speak of and this sort of thing. There's very few natives, too. Uh, Amerindians. Yes, the Spanish, the Spanish had already seen to that, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, in fairness to the Spanish, uh, there's also the viruses. And uh, yeah, this, of course. this yeah. happened in Canada, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a thing across the, the depopulate. Yeah, the depopulation uh, of the Americas is they, huge. Some estimate that the nine out of ten died mm, over yeah. uh, you know uh, over fifty mm. hundred years. But so, this is where the this is where the buccaneers get their name, isn't it? Yeah, because, well, because what, they're what hunting did... uh, wild pigs, wild uh, boars, and things like that, uh, which are running around, uh, and um, they smoke them. And you for that you have to have a boucan. Mm -hmm. And it becomes boucan, boucanier, boucaniers, buccaneers. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, then they have to face the Spanish who, mm -hmm. when they see them, kill them. Yeah, because it's a law. It's fine. You know, you're, uh, you're not Spanish. Uh, you're not You're not a subject uh, of the... And, and boucaniers have, are the, you know, the, the dregs of society, uh, because, <laughs> of course, they, kind of, they come out in the first place. Uh, they... Um, they have no allies, no uh, nobles protecting them, nothing. Uh, you know, they're so mm -hmm. the Spanish think they have a wonderful uh, uh, chance here to get, really wipe them out. Doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. No, uh, there's a, and, a, and there's this big animosity that grows between the Bucanier and the Spanish, obviously, because you of this. Are very right. And I sort of, uh, again, in this book, I sort of uh, explained in the early chapters that the Bucaniers. Uh, we're not really pirates, but they, uh, to the Spanish, they were, and they still are with Spanish mm -hmm. historians, but the Bucaniers, uh, some of them had seen eventually uh, in Tortuga and places like that when the Spanish came, and they had a few families and everything else, which were massacred, and, uh, and, uh, and they, had a, they came to this white art hatred of the Spanish. Mm -hmm. At any day, time of the day, night, or uh, year, whether there was a war going on in Europe, didn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't matter to the Spanish either. <laughs> There's all sorts of, you know, raids by land and I, sea. Yeah, and the I, I, the buccaneer, the buccaneer had um, little canoes, and if they saw a Spanish uh, ship passing by, yeah, they would well, sometimes uh, sail out and have a go. We don't. I couldn't find, and I couldn't find a source that gives you, you know, the exact interesting date else mm -hmm. on how when this happened. But there is mm -hmm. the story of this uh, uh, boucanier who sort of took to uh, a little boats, uh, a little boat, and captured a galleon full of gold, mm -hmm. and kept part of the Spanish crew on board. Uh, left the others on an island. Uh, this is this must have happened in the Bahamas, and um, then uh, sailed to France. Never, never was heard again. Uh, mm. Of again, you know, obviously bought a chateau and drank wine for mm. the rest of his uh, days, along with his crew. <laughs> but uh, some of the crew came back, and uh, get the word got around, and pretty soon everybody had a little boat. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. After that, and there's the. Uh, a strange, a strange sort of undocumented transition from these sort of hunted woodsmen who are fighting this sort of petty guerre against Spain. Yeah, to... it, 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 exactly. It was a permanent, uh, permanent thing, and there's plenty of incidents uh, that I relate, uh, uh, and you could relate thousands more, I suppose. Uh, but uh, there's a chronology of some of the main things. Uh, but it's not only about the buccaneers. Now, mm -hmm. the 17th century goes on. The first half of it sees the first British and French colonies and uh, in the West Indies, which they sort of share at St. Kitts at first, and then they fight each other and, you know, the usual adventures. Uh, the Dutch, too, and everybody's... Sorry, because Spain's power is decreasing, mm -hmm. its naval power in particular. And so uh, 
in that period, you start to see more of this and the Spanish can't really enact their law anymore. Yeah, uh, just quickly on the law, yeah. that example you 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 uh, used of Sir Francis Drake, um, I think, I've no, I haven't thought about this before, but it does make a lot of sense. The Spanish call them pirates. Now the British or the English like to call themselves privateers, also not technically true because you have to be at war to be a privateer but because the spanish have manufactured their own rules that no one else has agreed to (laughs) um i can see what you're saying that it's actually somewhat difficult to actually just say he was obviously a pirate well uh, yes and when i ran into that uh decree uh to me it uh it certainly made a resounding noise in the, my brain because I said, aha, yes, uh, we see this all the time, don't we? Uh, annexation of territory signed by somebody uh, uh, which is not necessarily uh, agreed to the ones being annexed is one mm-hmm. thing. And uh, the piracy in uh, and buccaneers now are often confused with pirates, yeah. uh, but... Uh, also, in that book, I made a table of uh, most of the wars I could find uh, between France, Spain, uh, uh, England, uh, and what have you. And I mean, it's from 1500 to 1715, and it's pretty hard to find a loose year in there. <laughs> this uh, is true. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, quite apart from uh, the Spanish endeavors to uh, wipe out the uh, the buccaneers, uh, there you go. But mm. uh, in the 17th century, uh, uh, you've got uh, other kingdoms that are looking to get territory, as we mentioned before, mm-hmm. and especially young Louis the Fourteenth. Indeed. Yes, in the West Indies, uh, there's been, and in Canada, uh, New France uh, too. Uh, there's been various little tries to, uh, since the 16th century, incidentally, to have. French establishments, even in Brazil, uh, everybody got wiped out in various ways. And, um, but uh, there's something going on in Canada, sort of tethering, same in the West Indies, St. Kitts. uh, uh, There's a lot of Francophones down in uh, the coast of uh, Santo Domingo, which is Haiti now. (laughs) They're saying, well, okay. And uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, the 1630s, those are sort of all fledgling. Louis XIV comes to power, and in the first thing he does is reorganize everything, as uh, explained in the four other volumes. <laughs> and I didn't and, even and in other and in other videos, check out the links below to see the rest uh, of our videos with Rene. Mm. And so, uh, uh, but he's looking uh, to France's. Uh, you might say, projection in the world. It's, it's, uh, it's North America with Canada, New France, Acadia, and all that. It's the West Indies, which, uh, you know, Martin and Guadalupe, and what else can we get there? Uh, and he's also got forays into uh, Africa and the Far East. They're sending fleets of ships and things like this everywhere with royal troops. Uh, so uh, this is during the 1660s, and sure enough, uh, the uh, the West Indies look promising. He's noticed, he doesn't say so in his memoir, but I think that uh, he noticed that the British got a nice chunk of land uh, in Jamaica, <laughs> uh, thanks to the... Uh, ah, yes, the, Cromwell's uh, little expedition. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, they, they, they had some problems uh, attacking Santo Domingo, the, Spanish, the Dominican Republic now, uh, but otherwise uh, they, they took a consolation price. Yeah. So uh, Louis, meantime, has got little islands and things like this, but and French Guiana, which is sort of uh, iffy. Uh, so uh, the play, it needs order, you know. Louis is a great one to sort of the hoarder, disorder reigned everywhere. And by George, uh, in my overseas territories, I will see to it. 
and so gets uh, this new Royal Navy too is uh, mm -hmm. getting very, uh, very powerful, very fast. And uh, in 1664, he names a governor general for America, the Count de Tracy, and puts a few companies of soldiers on board and off they go to uh, abolish uh, and install a new French West, in <clears throat> West India company. Because uh, many of these are formed by merchants and they all go in various ways. And it's, this one's got royal backing and money and, uh, and power. So uh, they secure uh, French Guiana at first, put in new governors mm -hmm. and leave uh, not too many troops there, but some. And then, and then they do this in the West Indies and they do this in Canada too. Mm -hmm. Uh, because here's uh, the evil Iroquois, you know, that are... Ah, yes. <laughs> so uh, they sent a regiment there. Uh, that's, a whole, that's a whole other video uh, of oh, the... Oh, that's a whole other book, the, the, Yeah, the, 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 well, the wars with the French and the Iroquois. Actually, uh, Charles uh, Singleton, uh, that uh, alien wanted me to do that, but I... Oh, tempting. <laughs> uh, I, I was, oh, not New France again. Uh, <laughs> And you really have you really have to return to your roots at some point, Rene. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, so what I've written uh, a number of things that were published in Canada, en français, and in English oh. about New France, and you get sort of tired after a while. I can understand that. I can understand that. But the people, the people want it, Rene. The uh, fans, yeah. the fans want New France. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep drinking wine, and I don't, uh, I don't do much exercise, so I should live for a long time yet. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, uh, back to the Louis, Uncle Louis, um, that is his world plan, if you like. It's the vision that he has. And uh, there's antecedents, which we mentioned earlier. And now uh, he wants to be there. Oh. Uh, there's uh, time passes. and But in 1674, there's a militarily for the uh, overseas dominions it's a big event um the dutch come over with the router and four thousand men on board and attack martinique uh, fort royal there's hardly anyone there uh, a handful of marines on board a, a ship a militia the governor's guard and that's about it uh, so it's a handful of guys which defeat uh, the Dutch uh -huh. because Fort Royal uh, is uh, ends up being more of a fortifications than the Dutch thought. And at the same time, the router said, what are we doing here? <laughs> uh, so after a, a couple of, a few, a few days, he said, the heck with this, we're going back to Europe. Uh, and this was supposed to be a plan to uh, invade the, you know, various islands that didn't work. Mm -hmm. So that was that. And uh, in 1674, uh, that was part of a plan to take all the French colonies, didn't work out. Uh, Louis, in the meantime, at court, uh, even before that, two years earlier, had made instructions to, gee, uh, better send 600 troops uh to uh to to the west indies for protection but you know the dutch war was starting they didn't get to it uh and and once he heard about that he said you are going to go and send 800 men right away mm -hmm. to uh yes but sir we the army is full he said you know then you're the navy get something uh, and and they get him out Mm -hmm. uh, eight companies uh, or ten companies, I don't remember, but uh, and their job is to become the garrisons of the French islands. Mm -hmm. It's permanent garrisons, and uh, these will be are the first permanent uh, troupe de la marine mm -hmm. uh, because they tended to you know hire them, and then when they cruise us over, well, okay, we'll talk to you later, and uh, the. Uh, but uh, they were, and they became uh, Compagnie France la Marine in time. Oh. Uh, and they were not regiments, and they were under the Ministry of the Navy. Uh -huh. And they remain so to the, almost to this day. Uh, oh, because the troupe, the troupe de la Marine 
uh, which are of an organization a bit like the U.S. Marine Corps, not mm -hmm. the British Marines. Uh, it's uh, they're still around, and they, in fact, I for the Marine Museum in Les Abrettes, I wrote a, a short uh, history of the Troupe de Marine, all of them. Excellent. Uh, all of them. Well, the, the Compagnie Franche. All Twice. Of them. Uh, you know, and it's apparently the first time that <laughs> that's been attempted. So it was sort of fun. I, but, I, re I remember you telling me about it. I'm, I'm yeah. looking so forward were, to reading that. Oh, well, you know, uh, contact the Sabretage or the Musée des Troubles de in Fréjus, and they have copies. And in Brest, too. <laughs> and <laughs> Excellent. Other places. Okay, the, mm. uh, so that, that happens. There's various battles and so on with the Dutch and things like this in the 1670s, but they're getting established. Uh, by then, uh, Louis XIV is fully aware of those strange people out on the coast of Saint-Domingue in Haiti, in the, the Boucanier, and he can see right away that there's a there's something to do to be done here, just like in England. Uh, there were uh, Morgan and his people mm -hmm. in Port Royal and all the rest of it. They all, they all were great buddies, by the way, at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, bre uh, the bre the Brethren of the Coast. Yes. And, uh, you know, there was a Dutchman there too, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, the English language uh, sources don't concentrate much on the French, <clears throat> but I did. Well, yes, exactly. I was going to say most of the English uh, books in English about you know pirates and buccaneers yeah. uh, give you the impression that um, you know it's all very sort of Northern European Protestant proto pirate thing going on here. But if you look in a little deeper, you find quite a lot of a lot more diversity uh, nationality wise, and you know uh, there's a lot of French people involved that don't get a lot of. Uh, um headline space yeah well uh, the uh, and it's a bit confusing uh the uh, on how it works because louis the 14th the sun uh decides that for one part of the islands in the sun he's not sending a garrison mm. that's in saint domingue tortuga mm. and all that but he appoints a buccaneer uh, buccaneering type of naval officer uh as uh, governor I love uh, that. That's that's brilliant. <laughs> uh, so you know he preempts uh, Henry Morgan in, that, mm. in Jamaica uh, by a by a number of years. But well, yeah, uh, I mean, before Port Royal became like the buccaneering place, Tortuga was the place, and that was a suit, basically a French yeah uh, there, place. There were several. Well, it was um, until the late fifties, early sixties, uh, sixteen. And uh, most of the French buccaneers, uh, well, spread out, but went to a place which nobody knows now, the Petit Gouave. Oh, which, right. Yeah. And that became the Brethren of the Coast, uh, Saint-Domingue version, the, the, the big place. And um, it seems to have had a Port Royal-like uh, uh social life <laughs> uh, and it's good harbor too mm -hmm. uh and so uh Petit Gouave, uh becomes more and more interesting and uh they sort of install the first fortifications of the 1680s there's still no regular troops of sort although there are sort of detachments that seem to show up every once in a while mm -hmm. uh because the, the buccaneers aren't necessarily in um, in great uh, in great enthusiasms of getting orders from Louis. No, and uh, by this point as well, obviously we're getting the fact. An, inter an interesting thing happens, isn't it? Because the buccaneers who are in Petit Guave um, yeah. are not the same, just sort of huntsmen kind of hunters of the woods sort of people these are like adventurers and and people who have come out from europe um looking for cash looking for spanish gold essentially they uh, my view is that it is a part of the same yeah. some of them are the hunters and they're still hunting because there's uh 
uh, Father, Father Duterte, uh, who was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Labatt, who was there in the early 1700s, late 1600s, goes hunting with them. Uh, yes. And he yes. describes them, and they're pretty, pretty wild. Uh, and um, I have, just... I'm remembering now as well, they're very, actually, they're still very famous for their skill with uh, muskets. Yes. Well, they developed their own musket. Uh, and uh, there's technical data in that work as to how this came about and what was this thing like. Uh, well, mm. it apparently it could shoot accurately. It's very long, long barrel. It's a buccaneer musket, which was known commonly in the 18th century, uh, especially as a ship's musket. But as it turned out, a lot mm. of settlers had them too. Okay. So it, it, unlike with Henry Morgan and stuff like that, um, the French Bucanier are still v sort of closer to the original, um, you know, inhabitants, those hunters. Uh... Uh, well, by that time, uh, the uh, buccaneers, I'd say that in the 1660s, it's the same, pretty well the same gang. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're going to one place or the other. And uh, for instance, uh, I, uh, I found a... Uh, a note uh, that uh, uh, when Henry Morgan uh, was preparing his uh, raid on P Panama, which was, you know, everybody knows about, uh, he, uh, at Petit Gouave, they knew about this and a number of, you know, and there was a call, hey, come and join us. And the, the French would do the same uh, with uh, the English buccaneers at that time. So uh, it's, and in fact, who was English and who was French is always a good, a good question. <laughs> yes. uh, the, uh, and where did the English buccaneers come from? Well, I suspect they were English buccaneers that were on the coast of Saint-Domingue. Yeah, I, I think they were a kind of a mixture of it, you know, it, like drafts of uh, royal troops sent out to garrison yeah. places and people who were already there. And, you know, they're, well, they're a very crazy bunch of people. Well, there's uh, there's suppositions of all sorts we can have because we don't have uh, things like censuses, you know. No. <laughs> and uh, you get get these thing, you know, events happening. Uh, and I sort of looked in three type of sources: the English, the French, of course, and even the Spanish. Uh, and uh, how things develop in their side of the the island is. Uh, sort of interesting too because they're stuck with these buccaneers uh, and they end up having lancers uh, mm. uh, um, uh, mounted lancers to try to chase them down but anyway that's a, that's a whole other aspect it's diving the, a bit uh, deep there but yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, uh... yeah but the, um, there, there's plenty of communications but from the 1770s in Jamaica the governments get serious about making it a plantation economy. Hmm. That hasn't happened yet in say, in French Saint Domingue because it's not officially French yet. No, it's just it's just it's just Bucanier. <laughs> it's just uh, it's, it's only recognized as a French territory in 1697. That is pretty late. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, it was de facto. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, and by then, you know, it's from 1692, Louis XIV uh, started posting troops mm -hmm. there, and there was a lot of fighting about what, that. Um, what 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 are the buccaneers, buccaneers, sort of um, feelings towards plantations and things like that? They're not really plantation people, are they? They're hunters and pirate sea type people, uh, aren't they? Well, the, some of them uh, were also uh, raising veggies and <laughs> like that. Uh, there's a uh, there's very a thing. I have a. Um, they were great meat eaters. Um, I, I have a, a chapter on them uh, in uh, specifically on their lifestyle, mm -hmm. and you know it, it's a pretty robust type of lifestyle uh, with their own code of honor and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, they developed that because, of course, they had no courts, no judge, no any, anything until the end of the uh, the century. And uh, they were pretty independent and so on. Uh, one thing I have to, I stress in the book like crazy because I'm a former curator and uh, material culture 
uh, and it's not only uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, really turned me on uh, because to me, they can explain what's going on. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, if you see uh, uh, buccaneers as they are described, don't look like, like anything like Johnny D. <laughs> yeah okay it's unbelievable there is mm -hmm. unbelievably rougher and in this book thank god uh <laughs> patrice Courcel was the illustrator and patrice is an old friend uh and a f one of the finest military illustrators around he, he did the and illustrations for my book he did the plates he did oh, 15 cool. figures wow uh, half of them or more or less uh, of Buccaneers, and I sent you a few uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. images, which you may or may not have. I have, uh, and, the, and and they uh, it's from the descriptions of the uh, the people that saw them and left them, and it's absolutely uh, uh, different and logical as to uh, what they're yeah. uh, what they're wearing. Uh, the so Hollywood pirates don't absolutely bear any resemblance to um, these people uh, whatsoever. Well, they have aspects of sailing costumes and everything yeah, yeah, else. But sure. then, you know, the big buckles and no. <laughs> sashes and things. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen a uh, Hollywood, Hollywood or British, because the British made pirate movies too, uh, the, uh, and the French, uh, you know, Movies, no. Uh, have you ever seen a buccaneer gun in a uh, in a pirate movie? I've never seen one, and yet they invented this thing. Yeah, yeah they, they were legendary <laughs> for it. They were legendary for it. <laughs> and uh, you know uh, the 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 uh, the swashbuckling. Well, yes, they certainly uh, were at that, and uh, they had swords, definitely. But uh... <laughs> oh, hangers and everything else, very. Um, and I have a few uh, illustrations of those, but it was all extremely varied for those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I even show a nice silver thing uh, pistol, which was in a Mexican collection before it came to Canada, uh, and uh, of course it was Spanish. But yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> well, easy. The closest weapons around. <laughs> well, you know, anything goes. And, uh, the, uh, what, I was the, curious. You know, you're talking about lifestyle, and they didn't really have the you know, law courts and stuff like that. Now, pirates of the early 1700s are famous for their sort of sort of democratic systems of how they ran their ships. Yeah, did they was... inherit that from buccaneers? Totally uh and the flag too the jolly rogers uh the cover, about the flag as well yeah <laughs> uh, uh, the cover of that book as a buccaneer more uh, dressed after uh 1688 uh, drawing by the way uh which sort of has all sorts of strange costume things it's european but you know wh what is it and uh patrice did his best thank goodness <laughs> and um and he's got this red uh and it's 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 a flag it's a description i nearly uh, fainted when i saw it it's a 1688 description of a bunch of french buccaneers raiding the western coast of mexico uh and uh and they say uh the and as usual, the Spanish, you know, want to kill everyone, so they bring out their their, their red flag, and they say and they had their white French flag, and they said, "Well, gee, the Spanish uh, came out the red flag, so we brought out our flag," and it was that, mm -hmm. and uh, so and there were a lot of other buccaneer flags which I described yeah. uh, or tried to describe in that part, but that's the uh, the material culture, uh, as you say. Uh -huh. the um and back to the <laughs> beloved buccaneers uh pirates uh, by then uh of the my beloved bahamas yeah <laughs> uh, well around uh the end of the say, 17th century um uh, jamaican uh, there's laws now in jamaica they have a militia act which is pretty uh uh 
organizes the forces and so on, they're starting to have a regular garrison, in short, have a regular colony. The plantations are being built everywhere. Some of the buccaneers obviously became planters, uh, Henry Morgan included, uh, and, uh, and a lot of his buddies. Uh, in 80, uh, Louis XIV territory at the time, well, dominantly, uh, it's, uh, it takes a longer time. But the same thing happens, but it's really uh, at the end of the 17th and early 18th century. By then, where can the, uh, where can the piratical side of buccaneers go? Uh -huh. Nowhere, except in the Bahamas and Madagascar. Yes. Of all places. Yes. Uh, these these have very sort of strong similarities to sort well, of the, the, early, the early days of Haiti sort of thing, where yeah. you know nobody's there really. Yeah. And but these these pirates are actually ex buccaneers in a way. Yeah. yeah to which uh, some uh, bona fide uh, piratical minds have uh, gotten into, like uh, Edward Teach, another mm -hmm. great. Uh, yeah, star. there was. There were the there were the the older buccaneering types who would yeah. only only fight the Spanish, and then there were the new guys who said we could just pillage everybody. Well, <laughs> they are really against all flags. Yeah, yeah. As as long as they are, and of course in NASA, uh, I mean somebody said there were four thousand pirates there. It's the ridiculous, uh, but. If you had about 400, uh, besides those that were out on ships, uh, you started to get a lot of action there. And uh, this went on for years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, eventually, as uh, we know, uh, in 1718, uh, uh, an ex-pirate uh, leads uh, the Royal Navy uh, squadron, with an ex-pirate is Woods Rogers, and you know, uh, installs proper British. Indeed. Uh, oh, yes. no, 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 you know. Yes. And, and we got to do something about... We got to do we, something... With a lot of redcoats with him, you know. We got to do something <laughs> about New Providence, you know, this this nest of pirates. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I knew the, I knew new, uh, the island of New Providence. Uh, I know it uh, somewhat. I was, I lived there on and off for eight years. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to uh, college there, and I in my first jobs in the Nassau Daily Tribune and all sorts of things. Uh, great place. Um, must have been great for the pirates. Yeah. Until uh, the Royal oh, Navy. Old uh, Woods, uh, old Woody. Oh yeah. <laughs> until old Woody, Woody came along. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, he had a very dramatic, and he made a very dramatic entrance into the harbor. Uh, and he uh, bef before he got there, he um, he he had a pardon. You know, he went in with a carrot and a stick, and he said, "Any pirate who wants to surrender, stay put and greet me." And a lot of the old guys said, "Fair enough," but some yeah. of the new guys said, "No, no way in hell." And <laughs> Vane, in particular, yes, Charles Vane. Yes, uh, and, uh, so Charles, in fact. Uh... Uh, went off to uh, uh, around Bimini or someplace, and then down, these are islands of the Bahamas, uh, met up with uh, uh, Blackbeard, mm -hmm. who was uh, cruising around, and they cruised around for a while, and then they parted, and uh, uh, Vane uh, and another fellow uh, ended up off the coast of Haiti, and then a French warship came up because the British weren't the only ones to do this. The, Good point. It, it was a try, uh, uh, basically fr uh, British. The the British simply had to do something about the Bahamas. Yeah, it was a you know uh, a nominally British territory. Nobody really wanted to go there except them, and. Uh, you know, uh, and they, they all got together and they said, well, we've got to, you know, navigation is, is, is getting to be impossible. We've got to do something about this. So the three countries, uh, the French and the British had the best navies. The uh -huh. Spanish Navy was just a mess at that time and uh, started. Uh, I found reports, for instance, that were sent to the Prince Regent uh, 
Louis XV, shortly after Louis XIV died, of uh, depredations and you know good reports, uh, well uh, well documented and everything else, saying okay this is what happened and send there okay you're sending a warship here you're sending a warship there. Uh, it's very interesting because you really don't hear anything about the 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 French side of um, pirate mm. pirate hunting uh, during the golden age. It's all yeah. uh, it's all Maynard and um, you know the guy who killed Bartholomew Ro- Ogle. Um, you know. what's, what's happening too with the buccaneers uh, that stayed in uh, Haiti, uh, the plantations really got going. Haiti is a very lush mm-hmm. country. No, we, you would believe it today, but uh, it was. Mm-hmm. And a great place for plantations. Uh, they made a deal with the Spanish that they could bring in even more uh, Africans from uh, Africa and all the rest of it. And by the middle of the 18th century, people were starting to call it the Pearl of the Antilles. Mm. It was, it eventually, by 1780 or so, some, uh, some people say that it was the richest colony in the world. It could well have been. I mean, I've read stuff about, um, you know, the dependency of the French state on the income from the Caribbean, yeah, and specifically around... Uh, and the, Haiti. Profits, the profits were extraordinary, it seems. Mm. Uh, there were about 40,000 40, French in uh, the, mm-hmm. uh, the colony, so uh, uh, and half a million slaves. Yeah. And in mm. 1791, the slaves uh, they were uprised. Well, exactly. The the importance of Haiti is is again reinforced when you get the the big uh, revolution in in Haiti, and nobody knows what to do uh, because yeah. the French revolutionary government doesn't want to lose it. But <laughs> oh, that would be another uh, yet another book. But there's been yeah. a lot of books written mm-hmm. about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, I tend to go a little earlier when uh, yeah. where nobody goes. So. Yeah. <laughs> My critics can't nail me. <laughs> very yet. wise, very wise. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, you are the you are the, the you are the boucanier of history. Then you go yeah. where nobody else goes. <laughs> well, I uh, I went to. Uh, uh, there's also the word soldiers in this thing. There is uh, yes, uh, uh, but the soldiers, of course, are definitely the installation of permanent uh, government order in the French colonies. And uh, they, uh, however, uh, they they're not installed as quickly as I said to, previously to in uh, in eighty, but it'll come. And in the meantime, they all uh, they're all getting together. Nevertheless, uh, uh, more and more you find uh, uh, the French raids on their enemy colonies uh, or other territories. Uh, having more and more soldiers of either as marines that come from France or as detachments uh, that uh, are garnered by other colonies, and the buccaneers we we I, we didn't mention have their own fleet. Yeah, and I, I have an appendice on that listing it mm-hmm. uh, in the, and that's reinforced when uh, a thing like uh, the raid on Cartagena de Indias in 1697 is a perfect illustration of that okay followed by the raid on rio de janeiro in Mm -hmm. 1711 which is which is are amply Mm -hmm. covered in those things i tend to give more attention to those types of things which are not known to the anglophone world because there's no british Mm -hmm. troops no 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 uh exactly i'm doing books on india now i know a book on india now Mm-hmm. in the 18th century and it's the same thing yeah uh there's you go to the british books of course you know he talks about the british army but <laughs> there, there were a lot of other things that it wasn't the british army mm-hmm. uh so uh and so so it is in this in this um the soldiers were independent companies they were posted as garrisons until uh, and taken on board ships every once in a while to, for a raid, uh, and there's plenty of them. Uh, the command structure was depended on the raid too. Uh, 
uh, but uh, buccaneer captains would have a say, and uh, sometimes there were some real uh, uh, general uh, fights of generals. Mm. Uh, but uh, there we go. Uh, but it was a, an alliance of means. Mm -hmm. The soldiers themselves uh, were sort of dragged off the street uh, out <laughs> and uh, sent out there. Sometimes they didn't know where they were going. Mm -hmm. uh, but they must have gotten, uh, I found some clothing bills of an arms bill, a lot of, Louis XIV sent a lot of weapons to the, uh, to the islands, uh, to the buccaneer ones and the other ones. He was just, you know, you want, how many guns do you want? Oh, sure, I have more. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. but getting fortifications made and so on. The soldiers, um, I was amazed to see uh, add linen uniforms really uh, in, as early as 1674-75. The which, anticipation of the hot climate. Well, eventually they they found that it wasn't always so hot, and though there was part of it in, in wool and part of it in linen, and it's all explained. But again, Petrus made a number of uh, plates of these uh, people and these soldiers and i had the documents and i guess others do but nobody had ever made a reconstruction of this so it's the first time that it's going to, like the buccaneers it's the first time that that's going to actually be maybe accurate a little more <laughs> uh amazing yeah uh but this is why you know as you were saying um it's it's fun yeah. to go to places where not a lot of people go um because it's a relative thing it's just it, it just there just are not as many people who write about this stuff or, in, or or study this stuff and so there there are delightful surprises when you dig into these things if, if people are brave enough to to hunt down the sources yeah. <laughs> and find and them it's, it's in a way it's the same with the weapons too mm. uh the uh weaponry in this case uh is fairly you know the muskets are not uh, really well documented and they are because then we uh, researching the papers and i'm not the only one uh we found a lot of contracts mm -hmm. now it doesn't give you a musket but it certainly gives you what it was uh, supposed how long it was supposed to be and you think for the compagnie france mm -hmm. soldiers and uh and there's a whole evolution when do they get socket bayonets and the rest of it but uh, uh in fact with those contracts when i was a, a middle-aged curators one day at a gun show in quebec city what do i see but a 1696 mm -hmm. it's not dated but through the contract we could tell mm -hmm. uh, musket which was mostly there mm -hmm. Some of it wasn't, uh, but uh, God, <laughs> did I? It's now in the National Historic Sites collection. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, all of that, all of that has been really fascinating to hear, and I'm really looking forward to seeing all those uh, all those color plates. Oh well, there'll be uh, all sorts of things, of not, course. Not, necess not necessarily to admit that I only buy books for the pretty pictures, but <laughs> sometimes they form a big part. <laughs> I, I, I think it's uh, it's a good idea to buy books with pictures, especially when uh, there's such extraordinary pictures to be seen. Indeed. <laughs> um, the other one was the uh, the colors, the colors of the Compagnie Franche. There's not only the colors of the. Uh, and boy, what a what a what colors these are! They were published earlier, uh, before in Canada and in France. Lately, mm -hmm. uh, found this description, mm -hmm. uh, this magnificent red and uh, blue sprinkled with fleur de lis uh, quarters with yes. a white frost and everything else. It's it's been around for a while now. Yeah, that's but, the, that's uh, the famous one with the um, uh, on land and sea on motto. Land, yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, gee, I, I really, that was, uh, what, over 20 years ago that I, I ran into that. But uh, my goodness, uh, uh, Michel Petard then uh, did a, I was working on national defense at the time. And uh, right away I called Michel and said, <laughs> can you do this, <laughs> illustrate this? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, send me the illustration. And of course, 
wonderful place. Uh -huh. But um, no, uh, and a number of uh, other color pictures in color. Um, uh, I got interested in the fortifications too. Um, yeah, you, you you mentioned the fortifications, and obviously uh, the the importance of the the buccaneer fleets. Uh, supported often by regular soldiers of these, you know, the independent yeah. companies and things like that. They're all sort of bonded together by the places where they have to resupply, and those are usually fortified places. So, uh, yeah, they're not the, uh, um, especially the ones in Saint Domingue, uh, A80, the buccaneer heartland of, for the French, and for that matter, Port Royal, Jamaica is not exactly uh, a greatly fortified place either. Mm. But they're not Veracruz, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, and not Veracruz, no. Well, Veracruz was taken by the buccaneers by it, themselves. It, it was. It was. It's really strange. <laughs> it's really strange, right? Because Veracruz is supposed to be the most fortified place in the Americas, so the Spanish say. And yet the buccaneers uh, took it at least, I don't know, at, at least once. Uh, and... They... <laughs> and I'm the Americans curious. took it in the 1840s. <laughs> yes, well, it, the French. Uh, uh, what the, the Veracruz itself is not uh, even fortified for a long time and doesn't have much of a wall uh, because they neglected this. Uh, I read the Spanish sources on yeah, that. Because there's not there's not meant to be any non-Spaniards in <laughs> the Caribbean. Well, the the citadel. Of Veracruz is uh, the fort of San Juan de Ulua, mm -hmm. and that thing, uh, I don't think no one has ever managed to uh, take by assault. Ah. Uh, it was bombarded and everything else. It was starved off. You know, the Americans did the same thing when uh, in 1846 uh, uh, and. Uh, before that, the Spanish, the last Spanish in the garrison in Mexico, uh, oh, sat man. there for two years or so, before finally leaving. You know, you couldn't take it, but you could take the city. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. The buccaneers uh, weren't interested in 1686 uh, in taking San Juan de Hulua. What they were interested in is looting the city. And they gosh, uh, they 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 surely did. A Spanish squadron or a number of ships showed up and didn't dare go in. Mm. And neither did the garrison of San Juan mm -hmm. at the Ulawa. Mm -hmm. So that was that. I'd say that in, I've seen the fortifications of Havana uh, after the British siege, what they built there. And again, nobody really wanted to go there again after the British siege. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, Cartagena de Indias, I spent a week there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's another tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, the French, uh, um, the British tried to take it in 1741, I think it was. Yes, they did. <laughs> Blas de Leon. Uh, uh, it, it didn't work. Uh, El, El Medio Hombre. <laughs> yeah, Leon. Why, well, indeed? What a! It was a superb defense, mm. and um, you know, it's always funny to read British histories when they're not succeeding, but they're making it look like, oh no, but we could look, uh, you know, uh, some other place, yeah, <laughs> in South of Cuba. Okay, uh, now I, I gotta give them laurels for uh, taking a place like uh, Havana or wow, yeah, but. Uh, and uh, there you go. Uh, the uh, there there were um, difficult places to take. I mean, seven again. I in Rio. I was in Brazil uh, in Rio several times. Uh -huh. Visited the forts there, uh, some of which date to the 17th century, and it was uh, uh, a job to uh, Duguay Trouin's raid in. I was going to say. It Ooh. was it was Duguay Terrain, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, there was a uh, now uh, for, for for the undoubtedly confused people who are at this moment scratching their heads. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, we have not actually mentioned specifically any famous, you know, 
he's a he's a corsair technically i believe or working it but we haven't mentioned names very much now dugay train there were ships named after him he was a legend why don't you tell the people who this guy was he was uh, a fleet commander with uh, strong uh, business uh, sense <laughs> and um, successful in most of his engagements, uh, such as uh, Ducasse, which is even less known, mm-hmm. uh, was a more of a buc- more of a buccaneer. He'd been governor of uh, of Haiti, Saint Domingue, so uh, he uh, he knew them all very well. And he went on to be a pretty good fleet commander in the Mediterranean. Uh, Duquet Duin, too, was all over the place. Um, the Rio de Janeiro raid was uh, uh, one of Duquet Duin's uh, ideas to go out and uh, not only make a fortune, but avenge a previous raid the year before that had uh, uh, not worked by uh-huh. a smaller fleet, uh, not as well. and unfortunately the Portuguese uh, uh, had murdered uh, the uh, captured fleet commander and Louis XIV was really mad. Mm-hmm. So uh, now the gate uh, uh said, well, it's okay, we'll finance this. You know, uh-huh. we need royal ships, we don't need royal money. Uh, we need royal soldiers and uh, whoever wants to join us, which is, was sort of not too many people because this was a heck of a way to go. I have a, on the, in the book, I have a map showing from where they started to, to Rio. And it's, yeah, it's a long <laughs> way. <laughs> and, uh, and again, I recounted uh, this uh, raid with some detail because again, on Anglais, uh, not, not a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, uh, but uh, there were some Louis the Fourteenth period. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, there were some defeats of the French fleet, that's for sure. But it was no Trafalgar. Uh, that that would take a long, long time yet. It was not uh, in the Seven Years' War either. That fleet was a going concern. Mm-hmm. And as a fleet, as another fleet commander, which uh, with uh, buccaneer instincts, was a Canadian. And that was Iberville, Pierre Lemoyne right. Iberville, who mm-hmm. uh, became renowned for his raids on Hudson's Bay, mm-hmm. and then went down to uh, the West Indies and the American coast, uh, happened to build a little colony uh, on the Gulf Coast, uh, which eventually became French Louisiana. Wow. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> heard, heard of it, heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I left a few Marines there to uh, be there for five years before they finally sent a garrison. But uh, this is back 1699, 1704. Mm-hmm. And Wesley Berville, during the meantime, well, he got the, the fevers and sometimes he's sick. But in 1706, he's back in the West Indies. He'd been there before doing some unfriendly things. <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, conducts a raid then on the British islands and especially Nevis, right, which was uh, a hotbed of the British uh, corsairs by then, mm-hmm. and he destroys Nevis. Mm-hmm. Period. Uh, the, the whole place uh, he takes it. There's a, he, he's even got a company of what some people call Canadian buccaneers. <laughs> don't ask me, but he don't ask me why but uh, you know there it is and um, i ran into the memoirs of another buccaneers a fellow named bo shane right uh, who was uh, you know uh, uh, kidnapped by iroquois as a baby as a child uh, somehow makes it down to acadia uh, nova scotia today meets buccaneers there uh, because it, they go around corsairs mm-hmm. and ends up in the west indies and eventually ends up a buccaneer captain <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, is uh, with uh, yet another uh, uh, french raid on uh, this time uh, 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 well, several of the islands in 1711 1710 um, and he but 
yeah, you get you run into these individuals and you really gosh, you wonder, you know. Mm. I mean, the 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 British have Morgan and a few a few more. Yeah. Uh, the French sort of know about these, but not too much. And of course, uh, with the language barrier, you just uh, in Canada, most people who are interested in history know about Iberville. Right. I think but, I've even heard of him. Yeah, in, in, he, in sort of passing. He, he, he was active on land and sea. And in fact, he was a, a squire, a sire uh, of one of the richest families in Canada. It was the fur trade. So mm -hmm. him and his brothers were very, uh, they all, some of his brothers and him ended up being in uh, French Navy school. Right. So you, could, on the rim. you could, you could absolutely make your fortune out there. Uh, in these in these adventurous sort of ways, if you could. Now, I think if there is any name that English speaking audiences will know of, of a of a French buccaneer, corsair, pirate, what have you, it'll be a fellow called Francois Lolonnet. Lolonnet, a very nasty yeah. piece of work by reputation. Um, he, he was a real true buccaneer mm -hmm. uh, came from Lolonais from the region of France. You know, buccaneers uh, went by nicknames a lot. Yeah. And so I mentioned a few of those. Uh, and um, he was a cruel mm. uh, fellow uh, with a white hot hatred of the Spanish. Who else? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a famous print where he's Tearing a heart out. Yeah. With <laughs> that's the uh, that's the famous one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know uh, the, the 1678 uh, edition of uh, Ox mm -hmm. uh, or he goes by several pronunciations of this name, and um, well, the 1678 is uh, version is in Dutch, I think, but uh, eventually it comes out in French, uh, English, and French. Uh, but the prints are interesting. I reproduced a few in there, but don't, especially when he's throwing structures and everything else. It, no, it's, uh, you read the text, you look at the print, you said, hmm. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the engraver and artist out in, in the Netherlands uh, really didn't have any sketch as to what it, it looked like. Mm -hmm. It seems from Panama and so on. It looks like a Dutch uh, mm -hmm. uh, town. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, but uh, you know, it didn't look. It didn't look like that. It seems. Mm -hmm. And uh, another yeah. place I've been is Panama, as a matter of fact. But it's the new Panama. Mm -hmm. uh, they rebuilt the city after the war. Uh, well, yeah, after yeah. Morgan's great by 1678. Uh, and I had the Panama archives because I always tend to go to the archives when I travel. Uh, the there was this nice map of it, so it's reproduced again, again in, in it, but as rebuilt. Nobody attacked it again. It was fairly, uh, mm -hmm. fairly so robust. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. This book is a treasure trove, uh, a pirate's yeah. treasure trove. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of, that. of stories and material culture and people you never heard of uh, before, which you really need to. I'm looking forward to learning about these people because, as you say, if it's not in English, you'll only maybe get a name or a sentence somewhere. Um, maybe, uh, but uh, oh, I I have a chapter on where did the money go. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> it was well, fun, but there's no records. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't give any. We won't give too much away. Then you'll have to you'll have to read the book to find out where the money went. Or we'll I do look, another we'll do look a, at the pictures. I spent a lot of time working on them. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you look at the pictures. <laughs> no, no worries yeah, there, Renee. No worries hey, there, Renee. Thank you. No, but yes, exactly. Thank you very much for coming back to uh History Land to talk to me about, you know, the many, the many ways Louis the many ways Louis the Fourteenth, you know expanded his power <laughs> across oh, the world such an inspiration you know <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i have his, i have his picture on my wall uh <laughs> but yeah no uh it's always a, a complete joy to to talk to you renee about history and you know uh, you're welcome back on his, on this channel anytime fine
what's next <laughs> that is the question what is next and with that thought ladies and gentlemen we will leave you until the next adventure in history land thank you for watching and thank you <laughs>